Welcome everyone, I'm K Plays Games. this is EVE Online and today we're going to be talking about shield tanking. Now because I like to keep all these guides self-contained with all the information you need, I will be repeating things that I already mentioned in the previously released armor tanking guide. But because I'm nice to you and I chapterize all my YouTube videos, you can just skip past all the stuff you already know if you want to. Right, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get into it. First of all, we need to define exactly what we mean by the word tanking. Tanking is your ship's ability to deal with incoming damage. Physically, it does this with three layers of hit points, which we see here if you mouse over the HUD. They are your shield, your armor, and your structure. They are removed in that order, so your shield is eaten away first, and then your armor is stripped off, and then you lose your structure. When your structure reaches zero hit points, your ship explodes and it's bad times for you. As well as these three physical types of tank, there are a few game mechanics which help to reduce incoming damage as well. Speed tanking is how fast you move. Generally, the faster you move, the less damage you take. Signature radius tanking is keeping your ship's size as small as possible. You see this here on the fitting screen under targeting. This one here that looks like a radar sweep, you mouse over it. At the minute, this Stratios, fitted as it is with the modules it is, appears to be 150 meters long. The larger this value gets, the larger you appear to be to the enemy and the more damage you take. DPS tanking is improving the damage output of your own ship, with the theory being that if you blow up the enemy, then they stop hurting you. Most ships can and perhaps should use a mix of speed, signature radius and DPS tanking to reduce incoming damage, but when it comes to the three physical tanks, it's generally best to pick just one of them and dedicate the rest of the fit to making that really strong rather than trying to do two or even all three physical tanks and doing them half-heartedly. There are some PvP fits that would use two or even all three physical tanks, but for the purpose of this guide, we'll be concentrating on just one of them, namely shield tanking. So let's dock up so we can talk about this more. So how do we know when a ship should be shield tanked? To work out what kind of tank a ship is best suited to, you can have a look at many different things. One of these being the ship tree, which you find here. You go to the Neocom main menu, you go to the ship and you open the ship tree. Here you can browse all the various different factions and every ship available to them. And when you mouse over them, you see their traits show up. And these ship traits can be a good clue. Something like the MOA will have a trait for shield resistances. So will some of the other ships. So looking at traits can be a good way of working out whether it should be shield tanked or not. There will also usually be an icon, you see here, you mouse over it and it says shields, so the developers in the game are recommending that this should be shield tanked. Pretty much every single Caldari one will have this shield icon. We'll have a look at Minmatar, this one says armor, this one says armor, this one says armor, this one says shield, this one's shield, so that's another little clue for you. Another thing you can look at is how many mid power slots versus low power slots each ship has. So what we can do, we'll just show info on it, have a look at the fitting. This has five medium power slots and four low power slots. Since most shield modules tend to take up mid power slots, if it has more mid slots than low slots, then this can also be a little clue that it might be a good candidate for shield tanking. You can also take a look at the resistances, as you find in the attributes tab. If it has better shield resistances than armor, then this is another clue. There's also many other things to take into consideration as well, from the ship's total capacitor pool, the capacitor regeneration rate, the ship's speed, the signature radius, the natural number of shield hit points, over armor hit points and a whole bunch of other things that may or may not affect your choice for picking one type of tank. You also need to keep in mind what situation the ship will be used in, what's it being used for. 
Right, so assuming we've gone through this selection process and decided on this MOA cruiser and decided that we're going to shield tank it, we now have to talk about the different types of shield tank. Shield tanking essentially has three different methods of tanking. Active tanking, which is using shield boosters to actively repair the shield during combat using capacitor. Buffer tanking, which is simply adding more raw shield hit points to the fit and passive tanking which is increasing the natural regeneration rate of the shields because shields will naturally regenerate themselves over time. Armour and structure do not do this. Buffer and passive are closely linked and we'll be diving down that particular rabbit hole a little bit later on. But whichever method you decide to use, you will also need to increase the resistances of the shield to reduce incoming damage. You have quite a few options to do this. We'll have a look in the hardware tab and the modules subtab and shield here we are. There are the passive shield resistance amplifiers. Here there's one for each of the four damage types. These just add a relatively small amount. We'll put one on here. So they add 28% resistance to whichever type of damage you've picked. These are fairly easy to fit. They only need one power grid and 20 CPU. The various shield compensation skills. I'm not sure if we have any. No, we don't. Th there are shield compensation skills for each one. And these boost the stats of these. So with maximum skills, they do actually get pretty good. There are also active shield hardeners, which do consume capacitor. They're just above them here. Again, there's one for each of the four damage types, plus a multi-spectrum one, which does a smaller amount to all four. We'll just put a compact thermal. So the passive thermal only does 28 because we don't have any skills in the compensation skills, but the active one does 42. And as it's an active module, you can overheat it and it goes up to 50. So that's good in emergencies. But these take more CPU than these ones, and as I said, they consume capacitor. This multi-spectrum one only does 23, but it does do it to all four, so it's a good thing to have, just to top it up. And again, this can be overheated, it goes up to 27.8. As well as these mid-slot mo modules, you can use the damage control, which is in the armor section. Mouse over it here, see it adds 10% to all of the shield resistances it's not a great amount but it does take up a low slot as opposed to a mid slot so if you filled your mid slots with other resistances and you still need some more you can come down here and do this there are also shield resistance rigs you can use here in the rig section scroll down to shield and go for medium because this is a medium ship again there's one for each of the four types of damage comes in Tech 1 and Tech 2 variants. Look the Tech 1, uh, 30%, which is pretty good. And the Tech 2 has 35, so it's a little bit better. These have a drawback of increasing the ship's signature radius. We'll just turn it off. So naturally, this ship is 135 meters long. If you fit a rig, it then appears to be 149, which makes you take a little bit more damage. So you need to be careful you don't make your signature radius too large, otherwise you'll end up offsetting the bonus you get from this. Do bear in mind that Tech 1 ships only have 3 rig slots and Tech 2 ships only have 2 rig slots, so if you're fitting resistances you'll have to choose them wisely. In PvP, you usually want to keep your resistance profile balanced because you're never sure what kind of damage the enemy will be firing at you. In PvE, most NPCs fire two types of damage, so you can learn this and tailor your resistances of your ship to match the NPC you're fighting. Now we need to talk about how resistances actually work. The percentages listed on these modules are not simply added on to your base resistance. If they were, that would be game breaking. See the ship starts off at 30% shield thermal damage resistance. So if we were adding 42 onto that each time, 
two of these would be 84 and 84 plus 30 would be over 100 percent so this ship would then be completely invincible to any kind of thermal damage and obviously that's game breaking so that's not how this mechanic works how it works is that these percentages are the percentage of the difference between 100 percent and our current resist so we'll dive into this a bit more as we saw with the modules turned off this MOA has 30% thermal damage we had a thermal hardener providing 42% so we're getting 42% of the difference between 100 and 30 so 100 minus 30 is 70 so we're getting 42% of 70 and 42% of 70 is 29.4 which is then added to our current resistance for a total of 59.4 which the game rounds up to 60% so we'll turn it on and see if that was the case yeah here we are mousing over and now says 60% thermal so we've proven that the mathematics works okay let's add a second hardener because we've decided that 60% is not high enough so we should be getting 42% of the difference between 100 and our current resistance of 60. So 100 minus 60 is 40, so we should be getting 42% of 40. And 42% of 40 is 16.8, which should be added to our current resist of 60 for a total of 76.8, which the game should then round up to 77. So let's turn it on like we've only gone to 75 so what's going on here have i done the mathematics wrong is this some sort of glitch no what we've encountered here is the stacking penalty game mechanic many modules will have this phrase listed on their description tab of the show info page penalty using more than one type of this module or similar modules that affect the same resistance type will result in a penalty to the boost you get on that type of resistance well, that's all very well and good, but what does this actually mean? In-game, there is no way of seeing the actual effects of this, but simply put, the more modules you fit that affect the same thing, the less effective each one becomes. For your convenience, here are the actual figures. The first module you fit will work at 100% of its listed bonus. The second one will only provide 87% of its listed bonus. The third module will provide 57, the fourth will only provide 28, the fifth will provide 11, the sixth will provide 3% and if you go any more than that you're a fool. As you can see you can only really get away with using three, maybe four of the same module on any given fit. Using five or six is crazy and only really for extreme fits. So not only is our second shield hardener that we fitted here fighting against the diminishing returns mechanic of the resistances game mechanic but it's also being affected by this stacking penalty so we now have another step to do in our mathematical calculations so we'll turn off the second one okay we're now back down at 60. so because this is the second module which is affecting the thermal resist we're only getting 87 percent of its listed bonus so we're getting 87% of 42%, which is 36.54. So we're really only getting 36.54 of the difference between 100 and our current resist of 60. So 100 minus 60 is 40, and 36.54% of 40 is 14.6, which when added to our current resist of 60 gives us a total of 74.6, which will round up to 75. We'll turn it on. Yes, okay, now we know we're doing the math correctly. So let's theoretically throw on a third module because we decide for some reason that 75 is not good enough. So this third module will only be getting 57% of its listed bonus. So 57% of 42% is only 23.94. So we're getting 23.94% of the difference between 100 and our current resist of 75. 100 minus 75 is 25. So 23.94% of 25 is a measly 5.985%, which is added to our current resist of 75 for a total of 80.985, 80 
which will round up to 81. Turn it on, yep, there we are. So as we can see, getting really high resistances becomes really difficult. This is where Tech 2 ships come into their own. If we have a look here on the MOAS info page and click on Variations, see this has two Tech 2 variants. We'll pick the Eagle and we'll simulate an Eagle. Yeah, I'll have a look at the thermal resistance now. This is with nothing at all fitted on the ship. It comes fresh out of the box with 83% resistances, which is fairly good, I'm sure you'll agree. Now, some Tech 2 ships, specifically assault frigates and heavy assault cruisers, can fit a special resistance module called the Assault Damage Control. And because this Eagle is a heavy assault cruiser, we'll take a look at that right now. It's listed here under hull and armour, under damage controls. Now we'll just put a compact assault damage control on it. This has two different modes. In the first mode here it's passive, it works very similar to a normal damage control, just providing a small amount of passive resistances to all four damage types for shield and armour and the hull. So that's pretty good, but it also has an active mode, and when you turn it on, it provides 75% to all four damage types to shield and armor and hull, and you can see this here, because the resistance profile has gone absolutely crazy. And yes, this is extremely game-breaking and very broken, but that's why they put this activation time duration on it, so it only lasts for 8.78 seconds, which is 9 seconds, because as we know, EVE works on a 1 second server tick, so you get 9 seconds of this, and then it has a reactivation delay cooldown of 150 seconds. So every 150 seconds you can get 9 seconds of really high resistances. This is a, a really nice module to have, it can really help. Okay, now we've talked about resistances and stacking penalty and I finished repeating all the things I said in the armour tanking guide. Let's have a look at active shield tanking. As I said, this uses shield boosters to actively repair your ship in combat. The shield boosters are here, right at the top of the shield modules thing. They come in several different sizes, take up a mid power slot and use quite a chunk of CPU and power grid to fit. But these repair you at the start of the cycle and they consume quite a lot of capacitor. Now with shield boosters, it's quite easy to fit a so-called oversized booster. As we see here, this is an extra large booster and it quite easily fits onto our medium ship. I mean, it did chew up a whole ton of power grid and CPU, but it does fit whether or not you'll ever get this capacitor stable because adding this single module means the capacitor runs out in 25 seconds. So instead of the extra large, you can just fit a large or a medium. Obviously they'll be easier to fit and use less cap and provide less boost, but you can fit an extra large on a cruiser or a medium on a frigate. Using much larger boosters works particularly well when paired with shield boost amplifiers, which we see here, boost amplifiers. These simply increase the amount of hit points, which is repaired per cycle. So adding 32.5 is a fairly decent extra amount. So this extra large compact shield booster starts off doing 596 hit points every 5 seconds and you add a shield boost amp and it goes up to 790, which is an awful lot. When using it like this, obviously you're never going to get your capacitor to run stable. So what you'll do is that you'll just pulse this as and when you need it. So when you think you need nearly 800 shield hit points, you'll just click this once and then click it back off again and you'll instantly get a big wacky shield. This is what's known as pulse tanking. So your choice is between a smaller shield booster that you can get cap stable or a larger one. You'll only pulse when needed. It does mean a lot more micromanagement, but it can be really strong. There are also specialised active boosters called ancillary boosters, which is this one here. Instead of consuming the ship's capacitor to run, these can consume cap booster charges instead. But these always consume one cap booster charge per cycle, no matter which cap booster is loaded. So we'll go to charges and click on it. 
Come here, this fits 400 or 800. See, when you mouse over it, it still does 980 hit points. You put a different size in, it still does 980 hit points. So the only thing you need to worry about here is how many of these you can cram in. So you always want to get the smallest one you can, or whichever one will let you fit the most. If we use Cat Booster 400 on this module, it lets us fit 7. If we put 800s in, we can only get 3. So obviously, we want to use the 400s. These normal Cat Boosters will only let you fit 7, but if you use Navy, Navy Cat Boosters are smaller in volume, so you can actually fit more of them. If you use Navy Cat Booster 400, we can now fit 9. This is important because this module has a 60 second reload. Yeah, reload time, 60 seconds. So once you've used these nine charges, this module will not function for 60 seconds whilst it reloads. So that's why you want to have more charges because you want to have an extra two boosts before it reloads. What you can do, you can turn off the automatic reload. So when it runs out of charge, you can still use it and then it will deplete the ship's capacitor. But as we see here, the ship capacitor only lasts for 5 seconds, which is one boost, because these things absolutely chew through the capacitor. But getting that one extra boost may make the difference. So I'd always recommend turning off auto reload on these, and also turning off auto repeat, so you don't accidentally click on it and leave it running, and it burns through all your charges too quickly. And I'd always recommend that you overheat it for maximum performance because you really want to make the most of these nine charges. You can actually fit more than one of these ancillary boosters onto a ship like so. So what you can do, you can now use them sequentially. You can use this one and then whilst this is reloading, you can then switch to using this one and by the time this one runs out, this one will be reloaded. And you can just keep switching back and forth between them. Or of course, if you really need to, you can use them both at the same time for a, a couple of cycles. So this can be really, really strong, especially in PvP. There are a few rigs which affect active shield tanking. Defense capacitor safeguard reduces the amount of capacitor that shield boosters need. Yeah, it's reducing it by 10%. And its drawback is that it blows up our signature radius a little bit more. So without this, the capacitor is stable at 46.1 and when we turn it on, it's stable at 53. So we can get rid of a cap recharger. So this can make a difference. Adding this module can let you save a mid-slot module. There's also the operational solidifier. This reduces the duration of the shield booster cycles. So you're getting more reps in per second because your cycles are shorter. This also blows up the signature radius, and because it's reducing cycle time, obviously it means that I'll be using more capacitor over time, so you'll need to fit more cap. One, one last little word on active shield tanking. When fitting capacitor modules to help run a shield charger cap stable, like we've done here, try to avoid using the low slot modules called cap power relays. We'll put one on. Cap power relays increase capacitor charge rate at the expense of shield boosting. I'll have a look at our shield booster at the minute. It's doing 238 hit points per 3.4 seconds. We'll turn the cap power relay on and it goes down to 212. So try not to use cap power relays. Instead, use the capacitor flux coils if you're going to use low slots. These reduce the maximum capacitor pull, but they don't nerf the shield boosting. Okay, that's active shield tanking. It's fairly simple. Now we move on to buffer and passive. I'm going to do them together because they work together. As I mentioned before, ship shields automatically repair themselves over time. Now when we mouse over this, our MOA has 2875 shield hit points and this time below it is how long it takes to go from zero hit points to full. In this case, it's a thousand seconds. So dividing these together gives us a natural shield regeneration rate of 2.875 hit points a second. So you go to defense and you select passive shield recharge. Well, this is saying seven hit points a second. 
so how's this? If this is giving us 2.875 hit points a second over a thousand seconds to refill the shield, why is this saying 7 hit points a second? Well this is because shields don't regenerate on a straight line. It's a bit of a bell curve. They regenerate fastest at between 20% and 30% of your total shield hit points. And then this figure falls away on either side. So this rate is the peak rate of that graph that we're seeing here. The skill shield management adds more raw hit points per level and shield operation reduces this recharge time per level. And crucially, when you add more raw hit points, you're not changing this time to go from zero to full shield. So when you increase the total hit points, you're also going to increase this peak recharge point. So one way we can do that, we can add shield extenders. So back into the fitting tree, we come down to shield extenders. Again, these come in several different sizes. I'll throw a large one on here. Okay, this large compact shield extender increases our shield hit points from 2875 all the way up to 5405 but it didn't reduce it didn't change the time to go from zero to full so it's increased our peak regeneration rate from 7 to 13 so it's almost doubled it which is nice but these have the effect of increasing your signature radius so it makes our ship appear 25 meters longer for each one we add on. So we'll add a second one on, just hold shift and copy it. So we've now gone up to 7,935 hit points and our regeneration rate has gone up again to 19. Adding more raw hit points like this means our effective hit points is going up a lot, which means we're less likely to get one-shotted in PvP. And in PvE, it will give us more hit points for the enemy to chew through which gives us more time to kill them hopefully down to the point where this natural regeneration rate is able to keep pace with the incoming fire there is a, a rig again we'll come down here shield rigs the medium core defense extender this works in exactly the same way it just adds 15 percent onto the shields that we already have and it increases our signature radius even more. So we're going from 7.9 thousand up to 9.1 and the regen rate has gone up to 22. There is one other low slot module which works here. It's in engineering and it is the power diagnostic system. So we'll throw a tech 2 one on. See what difference this has. See, this changes both the shield hit points and the shield recharge time. So this is a really nice double whammy module to use. As you see here, the shield hit point bonus, 5%. Shield recharge rate bonus, 8.5%. So this is a really nice module to have because it's not a mid slot, it's a low slot in it because it changes both things. So again, our peak regeneration rate has gone up to 26. Okay, so, so far we've just been looking at adding more raw hit point buffer. There is another set of modules which work to reduce the recharge time as opposed to just adding more hit points. These are in the shield one down here. Shield rechargers is the mid slot one. We'll throw one on. Again this reduces this recharge time by 12.5% much easier to fit than extenders it only needs well, less than one power and 20 cpu and the extenders need 119 power and 35 cpu so rechargers are much easier to fit these don't blow up the signature radius so what you can do you can just fit more rechargers than buffer there are also shield power relays which again work in the same way don't need any power grid at all, but they do need a decent amount of CPU. This gives a 25% bonus 
to the recharge time, but it does destroy the capacitor recharge rate. But because we're a buffer fit and we're not using anything that uses capacitor, the capacitor is still stable, so that's nice. And there's shield flux coils. Again, these don't need any power at all. These little bit of CPU. These increase the shield recharge rate, but they lower the maximum shield capacity. So I'll turn it back off. And then turn it back on. And our shields have gone down from 9,500 to 8,100. But the regen rate has gone up to 48. Rigs wise, we have the defense field purger, which works in the same way as the flux coil and the power relay. Recharge rate bonus, minus 20%, and blows up our signature radius a little bit more. So with all these various random modules fitted, our peak recharge rate is now 60 hit points a second, which is pretty respectable. If we throw one large shield booster on and then have a look at our active shield booster rate, it's 69. So it does mean that although we don't need capacitor, we do need all these slots to be filled to get up to 60 hit points a second and a single shield booster will oh, outperform all these but obviously it needs capacitor. So with this very wide choice of shield extenders, shield rechargers, power diagnostics, shield flux coils, shield power relays, extender rigs and purger rigs at your disposal, you are going to have to spend quite some time experimenting in the fitting simulator to see which works best to get your peak recharge up or your effective hit points up. With each and every ship having a different natural shield recharge rate and everybody in the game having different skill levels and implant sets and play styles, there's no easy answer to this. You're going to have to find out for yourself. So to recap what we've learned on this guide. Active shield boosters need a lot of capacitor and can be used for either sustained moderate repairs with a smaller booster or using a much larger booster and doing periodic pulses of huge amounts of hit points repaired. Buffer and passive shield fits don't use much capacitor at all, but can take up an awful lot of module slots and make your signature radius much larger, making you take more damage. Sometimes a buffer and passive shield tank can rival the performance of a shield booster, but uses a lot more modules. But as always, do keep in mind that the low power slots are commonly used for damage modules, so don't reduce your outgoing damage too much, as this will result in a death spiral where you need more tank because you're not killing things fast enough. So you'll remove another damage module and add more tank in the low slot, so you're killing things even slower, so you're taking more damage and you need more tank. And with that dire warning ringing in your ears, we'll bring this guide to shield tanking to an end. It started off rather technical and long-winded, but it got a little bit better towards the end. It did end with me telling you to go see for yourself, but then that's the nature of EVE Online. Everything's situational, and I don't know what situation you're going to be in. Hope you find this somewhat informative, and I hope you come back for the next one. Until then, do take very good care of yourselves and all those around you, and I'll talk to you later.